we had a, a when we were out at a thing, he was on his iPhone with a lapel mic and his phone ran out of space. Mm-hmm. So we have to redo the second half. Yeah. Do you? What do you do for backup for your recording and everything? I, you know, I don't always do it, but I just put my phone down. No, I just mean like doing music, like actual file backups and stuff oh. like that. Do you have a big system for that? I have. Talk about it at lunch. It's not that interesting. <laughs> I'm always paranoid about backups. Are we live? Yeah. All right. Um, okay. So, Dan, you've got something. You've gotten me to do. You inspire me, I suppose, is the way to put it. But <laughs> episode was really good last week, and everybody loved it, and we got a lot of compliments. I had a great time. But, Thank you. Um, this is what I wanted to talk about initially when I had the idea to have you come in multiple weeks was to get into this book that – I have to credit you for getting me to read a book, which is not something I do. I hate Next up, my wife. Yeah. Well, I hate reading. <laughs> Just um, kidding, honey. I hate reading, and I'm not very good. At, I don't read the way a normal person reads, but I'm not very good at reading, and I don't read. Yeah. And it, I associate reading with, like, school and all that stuff. And I think people have a fundamental tension with reading. To me, I even think surely nobody likes it. That's necessary. There's good stuff in it. It's good information. But surely – Nobody likes exercising, reading, or writing. That can't be true. No, that's, that's what not... I feel like. But you've gotten me to read a book, and I'm thankful you did. But I think, well, so I don't know. I'm kind of a nerd, but um, you know, and I'm also overweight. But I like exercising sometimes because sometimes. So what I do is I go to the gym, and I, I can't run. It hurts my back. Mm-hmm. I'm just being totally honest here. Mm-hmm. So I'm like 240 pounds. I'm a, I'm six two, but I'm a big yeah. guy. And uh, so I walk uphill at a brisk pace. I throw on my workout playlist, which is almost all like hardcore punk. There's some Emery on there nice. from from those days. And I air drum. And people look at me like I must be the biggest idiot. But air drumming adds, I find, from the heart rate monitor, about 15 yeah. beats per minute That's clever. to my heart rate. And I'm just like, you know, here comes Under Oath and I'm just yep. going for it. I look like an idiot, but when you get into the mode, like once you've been going for 20 minutes or so, I mean, that's really enjoyable. You get that sort of endorphin yeah. high, and it's yeah, but it can th- be pretty good. But I don't think I don't think that you like reading or exercise. I've still maintained that. You like what it does for you, or you like after it's over. Okay, so that's You know fine. what I mean? Yeah, like, it's a true. little okay. bit different because you like ice cream and having sex <laughs> yeah, because they're yeah, great, yeah, yeah. and you're doing them, sure. and they're, you like it. These uh, Exercising and reading, you like... Because you are, it's in the past. Not you don't like doing it. Okay, I mean I know some people no, disagree. No, reading with that, reading's different. So reading, for me, I I have ADD, um, probably, and for me it's like if I can focus on reading, if I can lock in, reading is actually a, a great joy. Mm-hmm. It is like um, it's like a good cup of coffee looking at a mountain range, or it, mm-hmm. it's it is enjoyable. It's not like maximally pleasurable but it is great like i i don't think you can it's different than exercising so yeah i'm like oh i have to be moving my limbs harder than i would yeah which creates my heart rate going up which then feels good but this is like no to sit here with my book and to go through the words and like see what it brings up in my brain mm-hmm. that is pleasurable but i just count that as learning i like learning is my absolute favorite thing being stimulated can't separate and, that from and, the act of reading well i, I mean an audiobook is one way to to that's true to do i, I like getting the knowledge i mean i feel good getting knowledge from things like uh, books is a way but it's one mm. of my least favorite least efficient ways and I so, but i got like, you to read this one yes and you why didn't you listen to the audiobook i don't know i just figured out well okay here's the way i read though it's <laughs> interesting like i can't i'm a very poor reader. You should hear me trying to read stories to my daughter. Like out loud? Oh, it's, it's, <laughs> she's going to be past me very soon. Yeah. I, yeah. Reading out loud is, is, I'm on a child level. No doubt okay. about it. Like, no doubt about it. I wow. can't, yeah, I just can't. You do just it. stopped trying at age 14 or something. I just can't, I, mean, I just can't do it. I don't know what to, what to tell you. I just hmm. can't really read out loud. I mean, it was probably a third grade level. I was not, not joking you. Wow. But, um, but I can read nonfiction and absorb the information in it extremely quickly but i don't even read left to right i just look at paragraphs and take the information from it like i, I read everything by sight i don't sound anything out phonetically or i can't read word i've never seen is like speed reading 
I don't think I don't know. Where I they, just, you know, I just you know roll your what fingers they're trying to down say. the page or whatever. I just know what the paragraph says and the sentences say. So I get a lot of stuff wrong, but overall, I understand sure. what's. Yeah. I get the. I know what the person's <laughs> saying very well because I understand who they are, what the context is, what I think they're trying to say. I so I miss you... words all the time, but I get the meat of it, and so I can. I read very fast. If I yeah. read by myself, not out loud. So I'll read a book on a flight. If I have a flight and I don't get internet, I knock out a book and get all the information out of it and move on. There must but. be – that must be kind of what speed reading is. I mean it's got – because when you when you start reading a lot or like I'm reading more nonfiction these days. Uh -huh. And you do kind of notice these tropes that nonfiction authors have to, to use. Uh -huh. and, and you kind of start skimming over – Yeah. Yeah, the maybe I'm just what people would call and, you know, scamming, I guess. But I feel like I'm getting the information out of it. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. That's what I'm doing. Although, so the, we should say what the book is. It's called mm -hmm. The Righteous Mind mm -hmm. by Jonathan Haidt. Why do they say his name Haidt? H A I D T. I've heard it honestly. I've heard Haidt and Haidt. I don't know what's Nobody correct. would want their name to be Haidt. Well, and then have I don't to know. Say, I, was, I, I don't know. In any I would case, think it'd be Haidt, but I, I've heard it said both ways. H A I D T. Yep. H A I D T. And he is a professor at, where is he? Some university in the yeah. northeast or something. He's yeah, a... but he's a cognitive psychologist mm -hmm. and a, and a social psychologist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so that book is about basically how our brains work when it comes mm -hmm. to making arguments and having reasons for beliefs. Mm -hmm. Now he oh, is God. in the middle of something right now and declined to be on the podcast, but I think only because he is busy. Nice, but it feels like maybe he could come on here sometime but you'll be the next best thing because you and i have both read his book <laughs> is what I figured. <laughs> we should have him on with but us, i'd like dude. i would yeah. like to have him on sometime but i think yeah. we're going to talk about stuff in this book this week and next few weeks there's some just it's just so fascinating and illuminating look into our brains and how we look at intuition is the big yeah. thing really there well so the the subtitle of the book it's called the righteous mind why good people are divided on politics and religion mm -hmm. basically yeah so he's trying to explain you know the old adage of don't talk about politics or religion at a dinner party mm -hmm. and he's like here's why that's basically what the book is here's why here's yeah. why you people say not to talk about those things because they go so deeply and they are such good candidates for this explanation of how this part of our brain works and and so they they relate most with identity because of this and this and this. And so he's just basically explaining that, which uh, – Super nonpartisan. It not, has nothing to do with anything no. other than how your brain and no, yeah. intuition and cognition work together. And the yeah. central thing in there, the whole everything is framed around his initial analogy and is what he calls it the elephant and the rider. Yeah, the rider and so the elephant. So can you – Yeah. You're more up on this than me, but I've okay. consumed the book and love it. But yeah. Tell me what elephant and rider is. Okay, so I'm going to use these pen? two items here. This will be fine for those of you watching on video, but I'll explain it anyway. So, uh, the elephant and the rider is basically a metaphor for how our cognitive systems work in our brain. Mm -hmm. um, and the best way to explain the elephant and the rider would be to explain a previous notion, which is the basically the driver and the automobile. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a more classic, so I'll use my watch since it's smaller. So... Driver in the automobile, here I'm the driver, this this bottle cap, and I'm driving this car, which is my watch, and the car is a mechanism. It's a it's a mechanical thing, it's a big machine, mm -hmm. and my brain tells my body what to do. So the rider car is brain and body. That's that's sort of the classic idea. And so on that view, then our brains are sort of like Drivers, in, drivers in of the, the body in the seat mechanism. of a of a car of a mechanism, mm -hmm. and when your body, when your brain tells your arm to move, your arm moves, and when your brain um, tells your, I don't know, your legs to run, you run, and maybe when your brain tells your body this is sad, you feel sad, or when your brain mm -hmm. tells your body like whatever, that's kind of the that's like a classic, more naive view of what happens. And his view is over and against that view. And he says, no, it's more like a rider and an elephant. So you'll notice the difference between a car and the elephant, <laughs> between the watch and this folded piece yeah. of paper, the piece, piece of paper is bigger. It's we'll a the really whole, big whole paper. The, uh, elephant signifies this very big thing. Much bigger, first of yeah. all. And then the second thing it signifies is that it 
has momentum of its own. It has its own thoughts. That that is, it's not a car. Yeah, it's not a dead thoughts body. Thoughts would be it's the wrong a, word. It's more like intuitions. Yeah, the elephant has things it chooses and wants to do, and you're simply trying to control them. Yes. So the rider then is what? So the rider is still the brain, and the rider the on brain. top of the elephant is... It's more like... Uh, the brain is more like... Um, Crisis management slash uh, PR PR slash yeah. uh, path plotting, right? Mm -hmm. So he describes it like this. Um, if you're in a car and you see an obstacle coming up, you turn the wheel to avoid the obstacle. Mm -hmm. Then the car has momentum, like a car would have momentum. Uh -huh. You'll have to brake. You'll have to whatever you'll have to do to steer it. But it was because you saw it. You turned the wheel, and now yeah. the car will react. In real life, according to hate, uh, it doesn't work that way. Your elephant, which is your your body, which includes your – it's really kind of it's your part deep of, It's a mind. lot of your brain. Yeah, the, it's, 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 it's not mind-body. That's, that's No, it's not mind-body. It's no. that there's different parts of your brain that you don't yes. have access to that yeah. are cognitive. They're more your intuition exactly. or your lower brain. So or your elephant, mm -hmm. all of those things – has an intuition and then it leans one direction or another. It's making decisions on its own to, to it, essentially. It at least, yeah, or like trying provisional, to yeah. provisional decisions to move towards something. Yeah. And then the brain goes, okay, elephants moving sort of straight left. I got to look out and make sure we don't run yeah. over a cactus yeah. or, and you know. So the elephant is really large and powerful and technically. Yeah much more powerful in every way than the rider itself. Only the rider happens to know how to control it some and can try to counteract what the elephant wants to do and ultimately can, can with some difficulty in training, control the elephant. Yeah. But at any given moment, whatever the elephant wants to do, it could be done by the elephant. It's a much more powerful force that accounts for much more of what a human is doing at any given moment is what its elephant wants to do. And then yeah. the interface to that is the very prefrontal, you know, higher part of your brain that interfaces with it. And the interesting yeah. about it is he says almost everything that happens happens first on the elephant level. And then yeah. most of what happens, you're simply rationalizing and justifying after the fact. Yeah. So this is kind of the big, the big claim of the rider and the elephant analogy is most of our arguments Mm -hmm. And or just say reasons. So someone asks you, you know, why did you vote for Hillary Clinton? Why did you vote for Donald Trump? Or if someone asks you, why did you pick this restaurant? We th we tend to think that we are telling them the reason that yes. we did it. And he would say sort of, but not really. Not really. Actually, you had an intuition, a movement toward a thing. And then what your cognitive brain is really good at doing is basically providing a defense. Yes. He calls it post hoc as opposed mm -hmm. to pre hoc, I guess. Yeah, post hoc after the fact. After the fact, you say. The slimy lawyer, right? Yeah, so this is the slimy lawyer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like we all have this kind of lawyer in our brain that we don't usually realize it's there, but we think we, we have all our reasons sorted out for being a Republican or for being a Christian or for. Wanting um, to eat the restaurant. Well, let's stay with yeah. the restaurant one for now. Sure. So I want barbecue for lunch i want barbecue i'm getting it and i don't yeah. know where that came from i saw right. i saw a commercial or my friend actually this is what happened this is today my friend brett was mentioned a barbecue restaurant and inside of me deeply i knew that i would be eating barbecue soon yeah there was no thoughts to it it was my intuition it's my impulse now somebody comes in the room you and i yeah. say I'd like to get barbecue today. There's this place, and they say they have this, and they have a happy hour like this, and I think maybe you and I should go out to lunch, and here's what, you know, I've been, this is my diet, actually, where it kind of fits in, because here's what, I, none, of, that's all after the fact. It's not the real reason you want to go. No, I just, I just, I, I found out that I wanted to go, and now, now I'm going to talk about it and rationalize it. Yeah, now you're going to, you're going to basically, that I to go, you're going to pitch it to me, because yeah. you're going to say, hey, Dan, yeah. we're going to get lunch after this, and wouldn't this be a good place for us to go? But you're not, and if, this is kind of obvious in a sense, you're not actually weighing all the places we could no. possibly go and presenting me with the best possible choice. No, I didn't you already wanted any to choices. Go. There was, a, there was yeah. never a choice. Now, for a restaurant, that's fine, of course, right? Because really, we could go to lunch anywhere. But it's still an illusion. It's still an illusion that I think that I rationalized where I wanted to go to lunch. Right, but Most so, of the time, you're caught in the loop where you don't even know that you didn't think of it and your justifications aren't the reason. You think, 
I'm smart. I thought about it. I made this decision. Yes. Not true. You just made that story up to tell yourself. Well, okay. It's not it's not quite so black and white mm-hmm. as that, but by default, yes, that is what we do. Mm-hmm. And so it's one thing when we're talking about going to lunch, but let's let's throw two things out there and get as polarizing as we possibly can get. If you believe nobody can tell a woman what to do with her body except her own self yeah. regarding abortion, or if you believe biological, human, spiritual, soul-given life clearly starts at the moment of fertilized egg, mm-hmm. if you believe something like that, you will never, you would never assume that you believe that for unconscious reasons. Yes, exactly. You, you would but, not. But you would you say, do. but they're yeah, at least. Most likely, entirely believe it for un slash sub conscious Well, so this is, where we want to, this is where we want to be careful. So some people have done really careful thinking about the question of abortion. Mm-hmm. In fact, probably most people who have written any books on it or whatever have really, <clears throat> have really thought carefully about it. When you do think really carefully about things, you are able to sort of overcome the rider elephant scenario. Mm-hmm. But it but it takes time and you and you're not you can never be as sure that you're being objective as you want to be. Yeah, and that bears out just by how many people change their mind on big issues. Almost nobody ever. Some of course some, but you know, it's you just think of it on those really strong issues like a person, a baby, a murder. Is it, uh, those things are like now the elephant or the horse you're riding is like chomping at the bit for some food good luck turning around to go the other direction you want to go like, yeah it's you know. so the, the more ingrained i probably the more ingrained these intuitions are uh the harder it is to turn around Let, let's use an example and I, I don't mean to pick on republicans here uh but just saw this poll the other day that when obama wanted to order strikes on assad in 2013 mm-hmm. and he went to congress and asked for approval 22 percent of republicans polled supported the move. Trump did it last week. 88% of Republicans approved of the move. Uh-huh. Sarin was used in 2013. Sarin was used in 2017. The situation with Assad and his people is relatively unchanged, mm-hmm. right? You you don't get, you didn't get a 66 point swing in GOP approval ratings because the situation on the ground changed. Right. People have a lean. They go, yeah, oh, Obama wants to do something. To yeah. I don't think we should do it. Obama Leaning wants to go to war. No, direction. Trump wants to do this. He's my I was guy. Already leaning that way. I, yeah. Okay. I deep I agree. down, my elephant was. You got to do something now. Yeah. And and so this sounds really cruel, but I'm not. I'm not picking on Republicans. We all do this. Yes, with everything. Everybody does this all the time, mm-hmm. right? So in fact, uh, just to so we can be equal opportunity discriminators, you know, all the rhetoric about how many people Trump wants to deport ignores on the left usually ignores and some people this is not true but many people making those arguments ignore the fact that obama deported more people than any president in history Mm -hmm. now some people say hey here's my article i was speaking up about that as well that's a person who has been consistent yeah but it's not it's just true. It's a true thing that of we course. do. We don't, you we shouldn't lean beat yourself way. up about that. That really either is the way you're built. So now, what the key is is trying to recognize the difference and in what's your intuition and how to talk to your elephant and being able to to name that and realize it and harness it, kind of thing. And they say decision making is largely intuitive, and that's why people say go with your gut. For instance, I mean, it's they, there's something there that is probably it's not it's not yeah. un, put it this way, those intuitive parts of your brain have access to tons of information and data it's just not your me thinking verbally processing you right. it's not dumb it's not even dumb it might be better than your whatever you could research and put in a pros and cons column it might be better information than that yeah it's actual data life experience feeling those are all tools we have in our brain they're not useless they're right. useful for decision making Right. But it's kind of interesting to see how that process really works because we're almost always wrong about if we had to articulate how we are arrived at a particular decision, we're just usually not getting that right. We're saying it's because of our, you know, logic, but it's not. Well, and so here, so here's where it starts to get interesting, and, and in a, in future episodes, we'll get more into what is called moral foundations theory, which is which is the the theory that he puts forward, and he's worked out with a couple other psychologists. But the idea is that at a lower level, 
than our conscious arguments, mm -hmm. we have moral intuitions. Moral intuitions. Yeah. Moral intuitions, and these are the things that then our conscious mind sort of gives us arguments for. Seeks and finds. Right. Well, no, so for instance, uh, libertarians lean really, really heavily on the moral foundation of liberty versus oppression. Uh -huh. So they tend to feel, and when they, they take, they have tests that you can take about this, where you can kind of figure out which moral intuitions you lean on. But a libertarian will come out basically feeling like, you know what, most anything is okay, morally okay, as long as it's not forcing someone to do something. Mm -hmm. And then live and let live, right? Right. So, it's, so then you, you talk to a libertarian and you ask them, why do you think taxes should be lower or whatever? It's not, and then they give you their answer of like, well, you know, the deficit is high and it's whatever. But at, at its core, and sometimes they'll say this to you, at its core, a libertarian feels like fundamentally right. the feel. main basis of right and wrong in the world, the main thing that makes something right or wrong is if you coerced someone to do it or not. This is called the non-aggression principle in mm -hmm. libertarian thought. So then someone says, well, isn't it wrong? Like, isn't it wrong that we don't have a military that can save millions of people from a dictator? They would say that might seem wrong, but actually, if you really apply this all the time, just don't have that big military. And if everyone did that, it would be a more just society. Now, mm -hmm. I'm personally not... I'm not swayed by that argument, but the point just being it's got that foundation further down mm -hmm. of the main thing that makes something right or wrong is if you are coercing or oppressing yeah. someone. And it feels that way to them. Well, no. I mean, they. you could maybe have a better – you could you could articulate that more clearly of like, no, when you are actually oppressing somebody, whether mm -hmm. or not you feel like it. No, I just mean they, they feel that that is wrong. They, they're – I think you would want to say um, their moral self – Whatever part of them is moral is just fundamentally geared that way. Mm -hmm. It's naturally geared that way. It could that can change. And one of the things that they get to later in the book and is to sort of help you consider how to uh, take more of the moral foundations into account. Mm -hmm. um, and then especially he talks about sort of like bipartisan conversations where you acknowledge other people's moral foundations and try and bring them into conversation, mm -hmm. but getting ahead of ourselves. Yeah. So the way this applies in a, in a lot of cases is people is is as if we're hung up trying to make our rationalizations convince somebody. Like that's what's okay. That's what's so ineffective about it is. Oh, you feel this way about abortion or foreign policy. Now let me use all this lawyer talk in my brain that I tell myself and try to put it tell talk to your lawyer about it, who isn't. I mean that's that's not how you come to a new decision anyway so it's very ineffective yeah so okay this is it's very ineffective to I use found my post hoc logic to yep. instigate new decision making for you so okay this is what i found so helpful which is why i'm for so damn frustrated because <laughs> i'm the time. that's yeah. the way my brain i work a little higher in the that way and a little yeah. less intuitive than an average person so i miss a lot first of all which is a bummer mm -hmm. um but also it's in, Incredibly frustrating to feel like you have it worked out logically and, and not be able to sway people. So, okay, you remember the, the rider and the elephant. Now mm -hmm. imagine two people trying to talk about politics. Yeah. They're not just people. They are two riders on elephants. Yes. Now, what we know from earlier in the program is that we think that the argument that the rider shoots out to the other rider. So my prefrontal cortex makes an mm -hmm. argument that your ear is here and your prefrontal cortex Processes as language. As language, yeah. and then you – and I think you get the words that I'm saying. You should be able to see that this argument is good. But the problem is that's not how it works. Yeah, and that's what's so funny about just – and this isn't in the book, but that – all you got to do to disarm that, everybody knows this intuitively, that this argument always works. Yeah, but still, that's what that <laughs> is. It's just, yeah, I heard you, and you're right, and you say, yeah, but still – yeah, and or, it just goes away. Or it, does, you say, that, it doesn't penetrate. Like the abortion <laughs> example is great. Someone says, nobody has a right to my body. And you mm -hmm. go, yeah, but uh, unborn children have rights too. 
And they go, yeah, but you can't tell me what to do for that. Yeah. It's still a part of my body. Right. And you go back and forth ad nauseum. The reason that that gets nowhere is because that's riders yeah. shooting argument arrows at each other, which are not the real reasons. That's not the real reasons The anyway. real reason you know, is coming up them. from below, that's right. from the elephant, mm -hmm. and then being coded into language. So if you are a pro-choice person who's trying to convince someone on the, who's pro-life, you have to aim at their elephant, not their rider. Yes. So you have to basically, maybe you won't be able to do this, but you have to convince them that the oppression of a woman's body is morally important and possibly that it's more morally important than, say, the potential rights or the rights of a potential human being. Right. And vice versa. So if you are a pro-life person and you want to convince a pro-choice person that they're ignoring this thing, you have to convince them that life is sacred, that life has inherent value and that human Until beings are so that. valuable yeah. that even a potential human being is so much more important than nine months of what whatever, yeah. right? You have to aim at the elephant. Now, that can happen. It's harder. And we it's a quick we think it will be so quick. Oh, I'll just tell them my argument. Yeah. I'm gonna shoot it back at their rider. They can process yep. it. Not true. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> you were saying how great this book was for you. I mean, I talk about it like if I was a biologist, this is my origin of species. Like <laughs> it explains yeah, it explains a lot political ruptures and, and problems like so yeah. adequately. See, I don't care about any of that stuff. <laughs> but but, no, but no, it but explains they, problems I have in my personal life. Okay, me. sure. Or, re because or religion, right? how does my wife not understand? That's what I told her, and I'm right. <laughs> so what's sure, the problem? Yeah. yeah. You know, because yeah. <laughs> right. you know, I've, I, you know, whatever it is. But that's it explains a lot of things. And also, just for instance, the good persuasive people or even powerful manipulators or and body language, all those things often speak to the elephant, and, yes. and whether you're conscious or aware of it or not. Okay, so, so yeah, so, so to... to Take it to politics for a second. Oh, you don't be you believe that people really make decisions based on their rider, not their elephant? Charisma is 10 for 10 since in the last 10 presidential elections, mm -hmm. which I believe goes back that, to yeah. when they were first televised. And nobody says, JFK. why do you like that president? Pre why do you want to vote for him for president? He's, He's got so much charisma. Yeah. Of course I'm going to vote for no him. No one ever says that. Nobody ever says that, but that's 10. exactly why everybody votes for the person they choose well, or goes to his church or, or whatever it is. Yeah, or I mean, you know, maybe the charisma is what par partly what gets you to – you know, the, the general election yeah. and through the primaries sure. and maybe it's what got you to be a senator or a governor and, oh, you know, whatever. Of course, it's it's op it operates all the time. But that's an insane stat. The more charismatic of the two candidates has won 10 times in a row. Oh, that's I crazy. would think it would be 100 for 100. I mean, it's I don't know even know how many convicting. presidents we have. Not 100, but yeah. I don't know how many. 45. OK, yeah, uh, it's it's convicting to realize that. And then you go, oh, shit. This is how my brain works too. I'm not above the fray. Oh no, yeah. Even yeah. that's what I'm saying. Even I just thought I was a cognitive person. I realized, oh, like, oh shit, I'm, I'm still way largely intuitive. Yeah. It's even even me, who I didn't think I was that way, and complain that other people are that way. Yeah. No, it completely explains most of my decision making too. You know, I just I like my slimy lawyer part of my brain. I like it. Yes. It works good for me. It's oh, comfortable. Gosh. I'm, I'm so good at know. that too. And, um, <laughs> and I'm really good at. So that's the funny thing. One takeaway you could maybe take from this is if you're really good at convincing other people that you're right about something, mm -hmm. then you're also really good at self-deception. Oh, yeah. that's Same token. That I think that's totally true. That's hard. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I want to transition this to the march, the marches that are coming up this weekend. Okay. So bear with me here. So there's a bunch of people who are going to now be marching. There's two marches in Seattle on Saturday. There's the Tax Day March, and then there's the Black Lives Matter March. Mm-hmm. And these marches are sort of like this collective attempt to convince the nation, right, that, that there's a problem. Uh -huh. That's probably a good way to describe a march, right? That's a very good way to describe a march, actually. Yeah, maybe not even I, could I, I don't even know if I could. I, I don't, like, I'm not a march person to protest. I'm not a, I don't even participate in politics because it seems like it's all meaningless. And when I think of a march, I think, well, that seems absolutely meaningless. Like, I'm good with the freedom. Oh. I'm not mad at protesters or marchers. But I always think... What's the point of that? Of course it's not meaningless because, you know, protest helped end the war in Vietnam. I mean, protests are not meaningless in general. Um, they can be more or less effective, mm -hmm. and you can have you have some control over how effective your protest will be, and some of it you don't have control over, and it depends on 
historical timing and other things that happen in the country or in the world. Mm -hmm. But the point being, this is an attempt by, for instance, uh, people who... So I'll be marching f on for the tax day march, definitely. Mm -hmm. I haven't decided yet if I can go to the Black Lives Matter. So what Matter do we march well. for on tax day? To so say tax day what? is Trump, release your taxes, and, and or Congress write a law for the future that all major party presidential candidates must release their taxes. Didn't they d do something where they saw his tax record one year? Not good enough? It was leaked, is partial, and it was for one year, and it said client copy on it. So as far as we can tell, it was leaked by the Trump administration to give a really good year, and, to, and it doesn't show that many details. So the, the thing that people are worried about with his taxes is not – how charitable he is. I mean, that's interesting. Uh, some people want to know how rich he is. That's kind of interesting. Insofar as I guess if he's lying about it, that what we're gonna do? Something. Find out he's but, a liar. Yeah, what are you gonna do? <laughs> I mean, oh, we just yeah, found yeah, out yeah, he he uh, is a hyperbolist. Um, the the more pressing question is uh, how deep do his ties go to Russia? You had to fill that out on your taxes. No, but you have to declare, for instance, like. For, for businesses like Trump's, I mean, if they get huge injections sure. of cash from yeah. Russian banks, uh, for instance, there is a sale, uh, there's a purchase and a sale of a Florida estate that he bought in the 40 million. So for whatever reason, you're convinced that this is important enough to, yeah. that you're going to participate. Well, let me finish this one. He sold it for 90 million at the middle of, in the middle of the housing crisis to a Russian billionaire. So basically, he was given fifty million dollars by some yeah. Russian guy that was not market value yeah. for something he owned. Why uh, can and it's not like the taxes will tell you because this, but, but it'll bring up data, the question. Data can be that, journalism well, yeah. can do its thing, right? Yeah. And you can say, oh, this guy actually is Putin's best friend, or this guy actually, you know, whatever. I don't know what it's going to show. It, best case scenario, he releases them, and there's nothing untoward that would mean that a foreign power does not have anything on our president blackmail wise mm -hmm. but if they do the american people need to know that they do and if we need to go to president pence because he's unrelated to that then go to president pence and get trump out of there i'm not saying it will lead to impeachment i have no idea i'm just saying the tax day march is to say okay transparency financial mm -hmm. transparency for the person who leads our country I think that's nonpartisan. Fair enough. I would love a law for Democrat and Republican candidates to have to release their taxes. All Everybody, the way down. everybody, I'll, do. I'll go all the way to every public citizen too. Yeah, I mean, just yeah, do it for big. Make office. it all online. Okay, Put it all yeah. On. Wow. Then you really find out who cares about the poor. Okay. Um, let's find out. So, and then there's another march, which is the Black Lives Matter march. Mm -hmm. People are obviously more familiar with that. There's a problem in American institutions of policing, education, sure. and prisons, and we're trying to call attention to that. So, so you're going to participate in both on the same day? Or why are they on the same day? Uh, they were supposed to be combined, and now they're separate. I have no oh idea boy. why. I'm not. Who I don't know. Who knows? But So are you doing point, both? I might do both. I mean, if time and energy permitting, I'd like to do both. Um, my problem more with doing the Black Lives Matter march is it's less clear what the proposed solution is. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is not to say it's not a good movement, but the thing I love about the Tax Day March is very specific. Very That's specific. Nice. Yeah, I agree. And it's saying we are raising awareness for this thing, and I will be t carrying an American flag with me. And I think that will rub a few of the liberal protesters the wrong way, but you know what? All right. This is American value. Okay, so how does that relate to elephant? Is that okay. speaking to an elephant? To so now, that? the protests as a whole are a nationwide argument from – it's it's kind of a lot of things. It's it's a let it's a it's an airing of grievances. It's a letting off of steam. But at its best, a protest should be an argument, and so a civil argument. A civil argument. Now, if the protesters, for instance, let's just stick with tax day, and stay away from the racial okay. <laughs> element as two no, white guys. No problem. Yeah. So let's stick with tax day. So if someone from the tax day march gets on to O'Reilly or gets on to CNN or whatever, and they're making the case. They have an opportunity to speak to the other half of America who's not prone to protesting their own candidate's president. Right. Now, when they talk about it, they can do a few things. One, they could say something like— Those would be like if you got to go on, say, on 
O'Reilly factor. Yeah, let's say, say they I interviewed protest me. in Seattle, and you get to go on with Bill O'Reilly. Yeah. So here's one thing I could say. I could get up there and I could say, um, unless the president releases his taxes, then the United States government has no authority over me. Right. I could go like far left mm-hmm. and get kind of revolutionary. I don't recognize the authority of the IRS because. Trump won't even tell us how much taxes he until, you know, we're doing a strike until Trump shows his taxes. None of us are paying taxes out of solidarity. We're going to bankrupt the government. Now, you could say, "Eh, interesting. You could imagine some people who might feel that way. But do you know what the average conservative person is going to think? This person wants a free ride. They want to save their own money. They're obviously being selfishly motivated. And at a deeper level, this person does not respect legitimate authority. The U.S. government and IRS have a legitimate authority over its citizens because they collect taxes, which provide roads, police officers. You can't just stop doing that Mm -hmm. because you're angry. Now, if I get on instead, I get on. They would just hear you as extreme and therefore not even need to take in what your points were. Because, of course, that's absurd. So I'm not even listening, is how they would at least probably say in their head. Except, you know, there are more liberal people who would listen and go, right on, man. Oh, yeah. You spoke truth to power. Yeah. But that's I right. Tell them. That'll, Tell them. This will help. We need to get that voice, that message out. Yeah. And, and what are you going to say? Yeah, I don't know. I think it's probably good either way. You know, because if you're looking at the two dimensional thing there, you're going to say, well, I could go hard and make the strongest possible arguments, or I could make weaker, simpler arguments. Let me think. Better go with the big guns. That's how people think of it. They yeah. think of it as, I know the truth, and you might as well pull out the big guns and say the truest possible thing, mm-hmm. and then fuck them, let them deal with right. it. Right. I could also, instead of that, I could say this. I could say, you know what? I really value America. I love living in a free society where I don't feel concerned that my liberty uh, will be compromised by my own president. Or that I can speak mm-hmm. my mind, freedom of the press, freedom of speech. And I think that there is really troubling evidence that our n- leader may be compromised. And maybe he's not. And all he yeah. needs to do is release his taxes. And then we, and then the people can know. Because, you know, and I could probably do a better job of framing yeah. it. I'm on the fly here. But basically, because I love America, he needs to release his Imagine taxes. Imagine if I go on Bill O'Reilly and I was looking to make that argument. I said, okay. Bill, here's the thing. I I love America. And in fact, I've been very surprised at how well President Trump has done with a lot of things. Yeah. I'm shocked, but I agree with many of his decisions. Things are far better than I expected them to be. However, I and a lot of intelligent people seem to be very troubled that there may be even a small chance that there's a compromising tie to Russia. Yeah. And that troubles us to a degree because if it were true, and it probably isn't, and I hope it's not, yeah. they would have implications that I just think are too profound for us not to explore. And we all are hoping yeah. for the best on this. And I assure you, Bill, I will let this go immediately and even even more so trust our president going forward. Yeah. But this is vital and this is very important. Great. You did an even better job than mm-hmm. I did. Now, I don't get booked on O'Reilly Neither if you do say I. that. That's the problem. The point, and they know though, that because they want the, the inflammatory guess, which is the yes. really irritating thing. Like, they even know that that, you know, there's people who know that and how to say that. They're not going to get to be on the show, though. Nope. And that's what's horrible about the whole system. Yes, but, you you might get a guy on public radio kind of talking like that. And maybe mm-hmm. Michael Medved on the right. Mm-hmm. But you're not going to get him on Rush Limbaugh right. or O'Reilly, and you're not going to get him on Rachel Maddow. Right. Right, so there's... That's unfortunate. But just to bring it back to the book and this idea of the rider and the elephant, if I want to convince, if I'm a person on the left and I want to convince someone on the right or the broader conservative public, I need to speak to their elephant. Mm -hmm. And now when I do speak to their elephant, so let's say – Did I do that in my I think you did. I think you did. But let's say that I start by saying, you know, what I got to say in order to convince them is that I think – legitimate authority should be respected. But I don't really believe that. You know, if I spent enough time with some conservative people, I think I would probably come to believe that legitimate authority should be respected. That's the transformative part when you really start thinking about this. That it's really a matter of time, not a perfectly articulated persuasion anyway. So you might start with just trying to persuade somebody, but what you might end up is learning a lot. You walk a mile in their shoes, and all of a sudden you're a better person. Mm -hmm. And so... that's. I'm sure that's true. That's the changing of yeah. the elephant. So the long-term strategy. Oh, here, so your vo- elephant becomes vulnerable. <laughs> yeah, you, that's yeah, the real goal. Should. In that, terms of personal yeah. growth, 
you want your elephant to have to accept new and more complicated mm -hmm. moral intuitions. And that's how ooh, you... Ooh, 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 slow down there. Now you really hit something that sounds right there. Say that again. The, you the want goal more of this complex is, moral intuitions. Yes, you... If you are a, if you are a pure libertarian, I'll just pick on them today, but we can we'll pick on everybody later in other weeks. If you're a pure libertarian, my hope would be that you would desire that uh, you could respect someone's argument for sanctity of life or mm -hmm. for respect of authority, right? Even when it's not if it's imperfect, but it's more or less just. Yeah, right? uh, or or any of these yeah, sort of yeah. things. Yeah, it's like, always complexity to be desired, right? So, like, yeah. what? Let's just take a, a issue like abortion. Do you think if we have more knowledge, more intelligence, more logic, the best minds in the world on it, that it eventually it will become or any topic? I don't even know if abortion is a good, one, but any topic. Do you think that it just sim it just becomes more simple? And less nuanced if we could just really think clearly on it? And uh, almost certainly not. I mean, no. there is a complexity, and you know there's complexity. Yeah. So striving for to make it sim simple is, is, is dishonest. I mean, it's just dishonest. And well, you see it in yeah. religion if, if more than anything, like, you know, Politics me and too. everybody. Yeah, both. But you're just great. You, like, man, I've been in religious systems before where I was so happy that they're answers. And yeah. I gravitate towards yeah. the one thing that, oh, say, Calvinism, but people say in Christianity, that has, man, it has all the answers. So if you're attracted to having certainty and answers, there you go. That's that's your jam. Yeah. yeah. So libertarianism can be that way. Leftism can anything. Anything can be that way. Yeah. Marxism. But it's but certainly you have to understand if you're moving away from complexity and you think you found something that simply has a bunch of answers and that's clear and it's black and white. You have to be. You you have to know that you're. That's not the right way to go. So this is one it of the. It has to be uh, more complex than that. So you should be yep. back to your line that I thought was so good is we should be seeking. To have more complex moral intuitions? Yeah. Not, oh, what, oh, I found libertarianism. It solves everything. I'm in. I've, I'm in. Good. Yep. What's, oh, how does it apply to this? Yep, got it. Yep. Not, hmm, if I spend enough time around Republicans and whatever, the Rust Belt, you would com might convince them some, but you would change, and you know it. And yeah, you would see their point of view, right. and you would understand it more, and you would be better off for it. And maybe yep. if you both, both parties do that, well, that's... Less am, polarized. Am least. I, as a person who canvassed for Hillary, do I just want to change the minds of Rust Belt Trump voters, or am I actually willing to be changed by their life experience? Are you? I mean, that's can the you could, could you? I mean, can you answer that? that? Like, is that? I mean, yeah, I, that, my hope is that I'm willing to be changed by them because they've experienced a life different than I uh -huh. have, and that doesn't mean that I will. But they're wrong. Well, I think that they're they bad, were wrong. Though. To... They're either wrong or bad. <laughs> so I think they were wrong to vote the for bad Donald people. Trump for president, mm -hmm. because I think that the effects will, in the in all uh -huh. things considered, not be good. But I need to be willing to be changed by them as human beings. Mm -hmm. So on Depolarize, the, sh the show that I host, um, one of the things we always say is, difficult questions never have simple answers, and when you make, and here's why. The word is ideology. Mm -hmm. So that num that word gets thrown around a lot. But what I mean by ideology is I mean a single lens through which to view the entire world that is dogmatic. So yeah, that's right. I don't know if that word gets defined that often. I'm gonna look. That's up what I mean. You keep talking. Okay. I'm curious what so, it is. Now I don't know the definition. You, you're probably right. On that's what I mean by ideology. So like Marxism is an ideology which basically says all of the world's problems can be encapsulated by looking at class and money. So, so any every, ideology is, by definition, uh, simple. Yeah, it has to be. Or something. So Nazism. Right, here, here, here's what I got yeah. here. What do you got? A system of ideas and ideals, especially one that forms the basis of economic or political theory and policy. And then the other one is yeah, the, the science of the study of their origin of nature of ideas. But so a system I'm, of ideas and ideal. It's a system yeah. for a way. It's, it's, a, it's a, a, a template. So technically, Isn't everybody has an ideology. I, I guess I'm using it in its more um, stringent and kind mm -hmm. of authoritarian, authoritarian kind of sense. Like, National Socialism in Germany is an ideology that says— It's a system and template, though, of how— Yeah, how, it is. Basically, that you yeah, adopt and, instead and of coming so, to a conclusion on every— It's a shortcut? Yeah. Basically. It, it's, a, it's a lens through which to view everything in the world and have an answer for it. Mm -hmm. And here's the problem. When you really commit to an ideology, people become secondary. 
and you say, well, look, we know the answers. If people can't get behind this, then they're impeding progress or they're impeding the good. Yeah. And so they have to be removed. Yeah. And you ask yourself, why has communism over the last 100 years, uh, I guess 120 years, killed 100 million people by its own leaders? Because it's evil. Right, but there's but evil through there, what lens, right. right? Evil enacted how? Evil being possible because killing is required to uphold the system mm -hmm. that explains the world. And so my thing is, as much as you might fear Trump or love him, as much as you might fear or hate liberal protesters, whatever, any time that you write off an entire group of people and you you subhumanize them, mm -hmm. you demonize them, you're on the you're on the road to serious uh, leftists or Trump voters, right? Either way, Either one's the other, and here we go. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And so it always has to be a movement toward greater complexity and compassion. And so, but the compassion is almost automatic if you just see yeah. complexity, compassion. Will, Almost yeah, sure so. to follow. Have you ever been anywhere and like traveled and said, "Oh, wow, I guess I get that." Now, oh, you can't say, you know, I've spent time with these people in this place, and I guess you can't say that about them. But that's only because of a person, because uh, I had dinner with them, that I can say that, yeah. you know, or whatever. And that's, yeah. you know, that's when people talk about you want a broad set of experiences. You should try, you know, those kinds of things lend to that very, very well. They do, yeah. And then of course, there's another kind of travel where you just you just brag about it at dinner parties mm -hmm. and stuff and you don't learn. Well, just expose you to a broad set of experiences, period. Yeah. At I think, least. I think if you that, pursue but. compassion, you'll end up with complexity. And if you pursue complexity, you'll end up with compassion probably. Oh, that's Either a good way. way to put it too. I think they probably interweave. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll next week we can talk about how it went at the, uh, at the, yeah, I'm interested rally. to see. And just to close that up, you think it's worth your time to go to a March, like just one less person. I don't see why it matters. Like, I I um I think about this a lot and I don't know, you know I haven't done a ton of protesting. I, I've done some phone calls and letter writing, and uh, I'm a part of a small group of friends, like about fifteen twenty of us that meet every six weeks and just decide w what we're gonna do politically, which is also like hmm. just a cool community. That makes a little sense. You know, I also get to spend time with people like like and care about and who I disagree with yeah. and and um, but you know I I do think that the tax the taxes thing is like right up my alley. It's like something clear. But you think your mathematical participation is worth your time? Even it's just he's like I don't know. I mean, like it's possible. I like it I as a mindset. Like that makes sense. Like I'm involved. We talk about this. I've just made the conscious decision that in my lifetime I'll be involved, and that should result in a lot of benefit. Now, of course, today do I go to this march or not? Seems absolutely nonsense. But <laughs> to, from my point of view, but, but in the, it's in the, the small amount of things, things sustained over time that always make every yeah. difference for your involvement, your connection to it. Like it'll, it'll pay dividends in some other way if you behave this way as an active, participating person in the system for over time. That is a great idea. I, I obviously support didn't, that. I didn't get Hillary elected in Nevada. Yeah. But I really valued the experience of going around and seeing these neighborhoods in Reno and talking to people and having conversations with people I would not run into. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's a catalyst for political involvement can be when it's good, a catalyst for just like a diversity of human interaction. Yeah. And you know, I don't know who knows what my role will end up being at the protest, probably very small in all likelihood. And I'll stand there with my flag, and a couple people will look at me weird, and maybe I'll get into a few conversations. So the American – oh, sorry. That's the last thing I want to say, and we'll get out of here. Yep. But uh, uh going to have barbecue for lunch. But you take the American flag. The the people, the lefty people will think, what are you, some uh, nationalist patriot up in here? Yeah, but you think that that will speak to people's elephants to show that, look, I love America too, man. I'm with you. And uh, yeah. I, think, let's, I, I you, think that's adding a layer of complexity. Not only will it speak to people's elephants, especially people on the right, it will mm -hmm. speak to their elephants, but it's also just accurate. Yeah. Like, it's it's stupid. Um, it would be stupid for the American flag to be co-opted by one political party in a two-party system. It's <laughs> dumb. Uh, you, you, don't, you can't let that happen. That's why I say yeah. about language and bad words and words being off limits. I'm like... If we all back out here and nobody's brave to wear that flag or to use this word that we know is okay, 
then it's just going to be co-opted by the the worst people, and then it's off. It's all. It takes people to be brave in the middle and fight for that. And so, no, no, we we like yeah. America. I mean, um, the American flag means a lot of different right. things to a lot of different people, uh, but it is the symbol of our nation. And if freedom of oppression, you could say, is like the main reason that America, like the main principle America was founded upon. Well, I think I'd like to make sure we're not being unnecessarily oppressed by wealthy Russians or the Russian government. Uh And there's a pretty simple way to give us some more clarity about that. So I don't know. You know, it's not like he's going to release his taxes because I went or something. I'm not going to be the... The, the hair that broke the camel, the straw broke the camel. Well, you back. might want to just value the fact that you, you know, just the value you may bring to the other people by carrying the American flag that are there, what might be an influence in the world that's positive. If, that's my if hope. nobody on the other side even sees it. I might You're be adding there. a layer of complexity to people on the left a little I bit. I might need to fuck up some uh, anarchists yeah. and, and sit on them until a cop can get there. I mean, you may have to. I don't know. Maybe I'll be there as a self policing force, a pretty big guy. Um, I don't know. But I. I don't. I don't think there'll be a lot of anarchists no. at the tax day march. It's a little too nerdy. And, and when is it this weekend? Accountant, like, yeah. So it's it. Uh, you can look it up. Tax march, Seattle. Just Google that. I think it starts at 10 a.m. on Second Avenue. On in what like day? Pioneer Square this Saturday, Saturday, the 15th, on tax day. Okay. Cool. The, well, you tell me about it next week. I'll tell you about it next week. How it went. All right. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Matt.